Live for the next hour tonight, an exclusive new development in the hunt for the gunman who attacked a British family in the French Alps. The latest on day one of the April Jones murder trial. And 20 years on, police reveal they're searching for new witnesses to Stephen Lawrence's murder. His mother tells us she won't rest until all his killers are behind bars. He died because these men decided they were going to take his life and they should be punished for it. This is Crime Watch. Hello and welcome to Crime Watch, live with the latest crime news and appeals, including the hunt for the murderer of 86-year-old widow Una Crown in Cambridgeshire. <laughs> the fear of when she took her last breath. I can't imagine what she went through. It must have been horrendous. And can you name those responsible for the devastating attack on Gary Hayward, who has been left severely brain damaged after trying to defend his father from a mob of 20 youths in Croydon. Get off him! Get off him! He didn't deserve that, not at all. Uh, I, I, I still have trouble believing it's happened. And former policeman Martin Bayfield is here again with more Wanted Faces and CCTV. Yes, and I must say we did brilliantly last month with your calls already helping police arrest five of those eight faces. Let's see what you can do with this lot, which includes Royston Joseph Paris, a dangerous drug dealer. If you know where he is, call 999 and we can get him behind bars tonight. And I have some shocking CCTV to show you from across the UK, including this thug who robbed a disabled man of his pension and a mob who attacked a GP outside his surgery before running him over in his own car. And with another remarkable insight into how detectives solve cases, Matthew's here. Yes, tonight we have the full inside story of how police proved a violent, jealous ex-husband had murdered his former wife. Amazingly, the case was cracked in part thanks to the killer's own sat-nav system, which had tracked his route 900 miles across Europe. It was a revelation. Um, actually, what we found was that this tiny little device had captured months of history. Who thought he got away with the perfect murder? But first, the latest on some of this month's biggest crime stories. And the process of selecting a jury has begun in the trial of the man accused of the murder and abduction of missing April Jones. The five-year-old disappeared from near her home in Mid Wales in October last year. 47-year-old Mark Bridger denies abducting and murdering her, as well as intending to pervert the course of justice. Well, we can speak now to the BBC News correspondent, Sean Lloyd, who is at Mould Crown Court. Um, just fill us in on what exactly has been ha happening today, uh, Sean. Well, we saw the first stages in this jury selection process for a trial that's expected to last six weeks. The 12 who are chosen will then be sworn in. They're expected to visit locations in Machenleth relevant to the case later this week. Now, the accused, Mark Bridger, who's 47 and from Machenleth, was brought to court today. He denies murdering April and all the charges against him. April's parents, Coral and Paul Jones, were also here. April, who had cerebral palsy, disappeared while playing out on her bike near her home in Machenleth on October the 1st last year, and her body has never been found. Uh, the actual search for April was indeed called off last week. Yes, called off just last week. It uh, was taking seven months in total. Uh, it was one of the largest of its kind in the UK's history. It involved members of the community and 16 specialist teams from police forces across the UK, combing an area of more than 23 square miles around the town. But April's body has never been found. She's still missing. 
Sean, thanks very much for the update. Now, police investigating the fatal shooting of a British family on holiday in the French Alps are tonight, for the first time, revealing new information about a vehicle they need to trace. Last autumn, the Al Hilly family from Claygate in Surrey were enjoying a holiday at the Solitaire du Lac campsite near Lake Annecy. But on the 5th of September, at around 3.40 p.m., having driven to the Martinet car park at the end of the winding Cumdier Road in nearby Chevalin, the family were brutally attacked. 50-year-old Saad, his wife Iqbal, his mother-in-law Suhala and a French cyclist Sylvain Moliere were all shot and fatally wounded. Seven-year-old Zainab, the eldest daughter, survived despite being shot in the shoulder. The younger child, four-year-old Zina, was found by police eight hours after the shooting, hiding under her mother's skirt in the back of the vehicle. Now, the French authorities, working with officers from the Surrey and Sussex major crime team, can now reveal that they're looking for a right-hand drive 4x4 vehicle, possibly a grey, black or dark-coloured BMW X5. The car was seen some 20 minutes before the shootings on the Cumdier Road, around two kilometres from the car park. Now, if you were driving or saw a vehicle of this description in the area at the time, please call the officers here in the studio now on 0500 600 600. Details for contacting the French detectives are on the website. We can also tell you tonight that, thankfully, the girls are recovering from their injuries. Both are said to be doing well. A gang of teenagers who stole high-performance cars and filmed themselves while joyriding have been caught and jailed. The thieves would break into houses and steal ignition keys before taking the cars. But it was thanks in part to their own cameras that they were caught. Police found photos and videos the gang had uploaded of themselves driving the stolen vehicles on social network sites. The eight men have each received sentences of between three and four years. Last week marked the 20th anniversary of the murder of 18-year-old Stephen Lawrence. A memorial service was held in London to remember the aspiring architect who was stabbed near a bus stop in South East London in a racist attack. Well, Matthew has been speaking with Stephen's mother, Doreen, and the detective leading the ongoing investigation to convict all of Stephen's killers. The first five years is probably was quite difficult now 20 years on there's something spurring me on to make sure that Stephen gets some justice he died because these men decided they were going to take his life and they should be punished for it on April the 22nd 1993 Stephen Lawrence and his friend Dwayne Brooks were on their way home when they were attacked by a gang of thugs here in Eltham in South London Stephen was stabbed twice, but managed to run about 100 yards before collapsing and bleeding to death. But over two decades later, this murder has come to represent much more than one incident of tragic brutality by a racist gang. In the last 20 years, the Metropolitan Police has been widely accused of not having investigated the murder thoroughly. The McPherson report concluded that Stephen had been failed by a police force infected with institutional racism and made 70 recommendations, including a change to the law allowing for people to be prosecuted twice for the same crime if new evidence comes to light. Finally, last year, two of the original five suspects, Gary Dobson and David Norris, were convicted of Stephen's murder at the Old Bailey. The court heard microscopic amounts of Stephen's DNA and fibres from his clothing were found on the defendant's clothes. They were both given life sentences. But despite the reams of headlines, the inquiries, the changes in law, there still remain suspects at large who need to be brought to justice. If you've lost anybody and lost um, in the way in which we lost Stephen, he didn't die by an accident, he wasn't ill. You know, he didn't go out and the car didn't see him and knock him over. Somebody deliberately took his life. And that's what I want people to remember, is that this was done. People were vicious, 
and the racist element behind it? And why should he be denied his life because of the colour of his skin? Just describe to me how important it is to try to bring those other people responsible for this to justice. Um, 20 years on, people seem to think that it's something 20, you know, why should we worry about that? But Stephen's life has, has meant so much and he deserved to make sure all his killers are being caught. Today, 20 years after the murder, detectives still want to trace people who were there that day. So how can people help your current investigation? We know that two people got off the bus, the bus stop that's behind me, and we know that they walked towards the Coronet Cinema. We know that a male ran from Dixon Road and boarded a bus there. Anybody that was in this vicinity on the 22nd of April, 1993, I would urge them to come forward and tell us their story. There's quite a lot of myths and rumours have grown up in Stephen's investigation. I can say he was not stabbed with his own knife. He was not stabbed because he was involved in any kind of criminal activity. He was stabbed because he was black. Last week, Stephen's friends and family, as well as senior police officers and politicians, attended a memorial to mark the 20th anniversary of his murder. He was somebody special for us, and we wanted to make sure that his death has not been in vain and those who are responsible for his murder are locked up behind bars. Well, Detective Chief Inspector Clive Driscoll, who is leading the investigation and has been for the last seven years, uh, joins us now. As we know, it's an investigation which has been dogged throughout the decades by, well, failures in the force, to be frank, and also institutional racism, which we all know about. Um, how can you reassure people watching that things have materially changed? Well, we're a different police force now than we were 20 years ago, and I think the McPherson report was actually a wake-up call for the whole of British policing. But we're, we're here today, and we'd like to build on the convictions we obtained in 2012. We know that four more people attacked Stephen. We'd like the opportunity of putting the other suspects before a court. 20 years on, are you still receiving information? Yeah, we, even within the last few days, we've received information which gives us quite a clear indication of what actually happened on that night. And what I would say to people is if you were there, if you have information, please come forward and tell us your story, because we don't know all that went on. And we do appreciate how difficult it may have been in 1993 to actually talk to the police and give us information. But I would say things have changed, and we'd like to hear from you now. You want to tell people watching tonight that there are specific individuals that you need to trace. Just give us some information on That's that. That's absolutely correct. What we know is that two white males got off of a bus and they actually walked towards Well Hall Roundabout or the Coronet Cinema. And I believe they would have seen the gang or they would have actually even witnessed the attack. But at exactly the same time, a white male run from the Well Hall Roundabout and he would have effectively run right the way through the attack scene. And he boarded a bus at the very um, bus stop that we've just seen on the film. Our witnesses tell us that there was a, another male, and we have an artist's impression of this male. He was in the vicinity of Wellhall Roundabout, and he wore a very distinctive um, green either jumper or jacket which had a V on the back or a chevron, and we'd like to trace him and speak to him. And, Clive, what about people who, around this time, were in the wider area? Important too, I guess. Yes, we know that uh, the gang that attacked Stephen come from the northeast footway and attacked him at Dixon Road. What we don't know is where the gang were just prior to the attack and what route they took to get there. That would be very useful to our information to know that. Okay. Uh, our investigation, my apologies. Clive, thanks very much for talking to us tonight. It is, of course, a long time ago, but there is no doubt that you would remember seeing something if you were there that night. If you did, you can do the right thing. You can still help. Call now. The studio number is 0500 600 600. And, of course, if you've been a victim of crime, you can call the victim support line. They're on 08 45 30 30 900. Now, in January, 86-year-old widow Una Crown was brutally murdered in her home in Wisbeach in Cambridgeshire. She was repeatedly stabbed, including once through the heart, and her body was then set on fire in an attempt to destroy evidence. Well, Yuna's killer is out there somewhere and we need your help to catch him tonight. The fear of when she took her last breath. How much did she feel? With her age and being a small lady, she could not have put up much of a fight. I can't 
can't even imagine what she went through. I really can't. It must have been horrendous. <laughs> this bungalow in Wisbeach was Una Crown's dream home. It's where she'd lived with her husband, Ron, for 40 years before his death in 2009. It's where Una planned to spend her remaining years. Una and Ron were married in 1948. They ran a village post office together, not far from Wisbeach. Auntie used to cycle round and deliver all the telegrams, as they did in those days. Yeah, they had a very happy life, I have to say. She really did enjoy life, as she did, well, right up to the end. On Friday, January the 11th, Una Crown went shopping with her niece, Judy, and her husband, John. This CCTV footage shows Una going into Tesco's that morning. The shopping trip was something they did every week. She was always ready on Friday mornings. She'd have her coat on ready, and she used to say, do you know you're the first person I've seen this week? It was like an outing. She knew, I think, that she would see people. It was company to her. 720 then, please. And could I have £40 cash back? Yep. 20, Una 40. would usually take out a small yeah. amount of cash to last her for the week. These pictures of Una leaving the shop are the last images of her alive. That's the last one, Auntie. John and Judy dropped her back home. They'd made plans for Una to go to their house for Sunday lunch, as she did most weekends. But Una wouldn't make it. It's not known exactly what Una did the following day, a Saturday. It was cold and wet, and it's likely that she stayed indoors. She had marked up her TV guide with an evening watching television. Police know that at 5 p.m., Una spoke to her next-door neighbour on the phone. Yeah, I watched it last week. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. It's on in a minute, actually. Detectives can't be sure if Una got to watch her programmes. The phone call was the last time any of her friends spoke to her. Police believe between 5 o'clock and around 10 p.m., someone came to Una's house. Family say it's unlikely she would open the door to someone she didn't know. <laughs> Una was stabbed repeatedly in the chest. The knife puncturing her lungs and heart. She had injuries to her throat and to her right hand, which police say shows she tried to defend herself. But her attacker wasn't finished. While Una was lying dead, they then tried to set the house on fire. Police believe it was a calculated attempt to destroy evidence. The fires didn't spread, but Una's body was badly burned. The next morning, John came to pick her up for Sunday lunch. Auntie! I opened the front door. When I pushed it open, there was Una lying face down on the floor. <sighs> smell from the house was terrible, burning smell. The body was all burnt. Her clothing was burnt. And I noticed, as well, there was blood on the carpet. Oh, God. <laughs> the house wasn't ransacked. Police can't be sure if anything was taken. But the £40 cash back from her shopping trip is unaccounted for. Una's wedding ring, which she'd worn for 60 years, is also missing. 
The level of violence used against Yuna was extreme. Whoever killed her is clearly very dangerous and needs to be caught fast. It absolutely haunts me. I can't imagine why anyone would want to do it. A puff of wind would blow Auntie over. She was so tiny. She wouldn't have stood a chance. I just can't believe. I find it very, very hard to come to terms with it. Or, well, I shall never, never come to terms with it. Heartbreaking. It is, it's heartbreaking. Detective Inspector David Grierson is leading this murder investigation. Uh, the wedding ring she'd worn for 60-odd years, £40, that's all that was taken. This woman suffered such a violent attack in her own home. Uh, yes, I believe she was attacked almost immediately after she uh, answered the door. Uh, the fires were probably an attempt to either hide her injuries or destroy evidence. Um, the fires didn't really spread, but there would have been a lot of smoke in the house that night. Did a friend or relative come home that night smelling of smoke, or perhaps they had uh, fire-damaged clothes? That could be really important. Um, we saw in the film there, from what your team has, has put together in the investigation so far, you think she opened the door to somebody that she felt she knew? Yes, she was uh, described as being very security conscious. Uh, she'd locked the door at all times that she was in the house. Um, if somebody came to the door, she'd look through the window to check who it was before she opened it. Um, Let's talk for a minute about the weapon there. We, you know, we know she put up her hands, she was injured in the neck, she was at one point stabbed straight through the heart. It's still missing, the murder weapon. Yes, um, we, we, we don't believe the uh, knife came from Una's house itself. The attacker probably brought it with them. Um, from her injuries, we're able to establish it's probably a long-bladed kitchen knife, uh, 25 centimetres long, and we haven't found that, so I need to find it. Uh, David, what about the time frame of the attack? Have you narrowed it down? Yes, we know Una had a phone call from a friend around about 5 o'clock and she'd normally go to bed around about 10. Um, she was wearing normal daytime clothes and her bed hadn't been uh, slept in that day. Um, so you've narrowed it down then to between 5 and 10 on that Saturday night. That, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid, uh, for now. As you've seen a devastated family, a terrible thing to have happened. If you can help, please do call the studio now. It's 0500... 600, 600. Now, Martin has got the first of his wanted faces. First tonight is 29-year-old Royston Joseph Paris. He's wanted after doing a runner while on trial for possessing and intending to supply heroin. He was convicted in his absence. Paris, who has a Cardiff accent, also has links to London, Leeds and the West Country. He's considered to be dangerous, so if you see him or know where he is, just call 999 immediately. Next is Martina McGrath. Police want to speak to the 22-year-old in connection with an attack on a man with Asperger's syndrome using a hammer, a wooden stick and an extendable police baton. McGrath, who is from the travelling community, has links to Essex and Croydon and to Waterford in Ireland. She has an Irish accent. Number three tonight is Kasim Khan. Officers want to speak to him in relation to an incident where a woman was stabbed in the stomach 38-year-old Khan, who's originally from Afghanistan, has links to Birmingham and Bradford and may well be working as an odd job man. And lastly, for now, is Yasser Hussein. The 32-year-old has been convicted in his absence of a variety of fraud offences worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's a tricky man to get hold of. After trying to sell the rights to fake energy drink using the famous Duracell brand, Hussein, who's originally from Bradford, has connections to Birmingham and London and to the United Arab Emirates and Pakistan. All of tonight's faces are on the website. And if you know where they are, please call 0500 600 600 or you can text 63399, type crime, leave a space and then your message. Thanks, Martin. Now, this is Gary Hayward, the father of three from Croydon in Greater London. Well, he has been left severely brain damaged and blind in one eye since he was savagely beaten by a group of around 20 youngsters a year and a half ago. He's, he's down on the floor, he's out. they got sticks and knives and everything. There's about 20 of them. OK, police are on their way, OK? They were just battering this poor boy on the floor in the middle of the road. You're going to have to get people here quickly. 
He is making slow progress. Um, it is very slow. You know, it's a day by day situation. We're hoping that he's going to learn to talk. It's a waiting game. Gary Haywood and his family live here on the new Addington estate in Croydon. But for the last 18 months, Gary has been in a specialist rehabilitation unit. He's severely brain damaged, he's blind in one eye, and he's unable to care for himself. Police believe the 20 or so youths responsible for carrying out the savage beating that caused those injuries still live in this area. He had a wide circle of friends. Um, obviously, everyone, they all knew him and loved him. Um, he got on great with everyone. If I went anywhere and they'd say, oh, you're Gary Hayward's sister, you know, they'd say, oh, he's really, he's a lovely bloke. Because he was, he was just so funny, everyone loved being around him. Just a practical joker, wasn't he? Loved by everybody. You know, he's got a handful of, of real close friends. On Sunday, the 2nd of October, 2011, Wendy Hayward held a barbecue. She invited some family members, including Gary's father, ex-husband John. He left the party at around 6 p.m. A few hours later, John went to his local shop. Some youths who'd been hassling him for months began to intimidate him again. John was constantly getting, you know, harassed by them. He got stuck in the shops all the time. Um, but that's when I felt a bit frightened. Um, I got into the shop. I phoned Gary's mum. Whilst on the phone, Wendy sent a family member over to get him out of the shop and past the youths who'd blocked him in. But Wendy was still concerned, so asked their son Gary, who was at home close by, to walk over and check he was OK. You yeah, Mum? Yeah, Dean's gone down and have a look, but I haven't heard back from him yet, so I was wondering if you'd go down as well. Yeah, of course, I'll give you a call on him there. Uh, Gary had arrived outside and I just pointed to the youths which are now by the library again and I said they're the ones that were hassling me. What do you think you're doing? This ain't funny anymore. Nuts. You can give me that grief. And then Gary chased after them. I tried to run after Gary. I couldn't catch up with him. When I did catch up, he was already laying in the road. Um, I got to him, helped him up, and he he then uh, shouted at the youths, "Leave my dad alone!" Gary, leave it. And then we saw all these other youths coming from the other end of the parade. As the violence escalated, more people joined the mob. They armed themselves with sticks and pool cues. I, I remember them knocking Gary to the ground. They were beating him all the time, non-stop. Um, they were beating me as well. At that point, I decided to lay still. John pretended to be unconscious and escaped with cuts and bruises. Gary, however, fared far, far worse. I was covered from head to foot in blood. Um, his mum was crying. He was choking. He was covered in blood. I went onto my knees and I held him. I didn't, did not expect him to be like that. When I looked at him, I just thought, you can't recover from this. We never thought he'd make it to hospital, to tell the truth. The ambulance crew were amazed that he made it to hospital alive. Detectives are convinced there are people living on this estate who know who is responsible for wrecking Gary's life. And they have a very clear message for them. It's not too late to come forward. Who wants people like that walking around the street free, you know, if you... You should be able to walk around the street safely and, you know, whoever does... Whoever does speak up, they're a hero in my book. 
He didn't deserve that, not at all. Uh, I, I still have trouble believing it's happened. That's the, best, that's the best outcome we can hope for, really, is that Gary gets his justice and Gary can't fight for it for himself. Appalling. Well, joining me now is D.I. Simon Harding. A really vicious attack. We should be under no illusions that Gary was left with the severest of injuries following this. Yes, he was. Um, as you say, severe injuries has left him uh, brain damaged. Um, as you see from the film, um, he can't care for himself, he can't walk, he can't talk. After the attack, uh, he had a quarter of his skull removed just to release the pressure uh, from his brain. Uh, surgeons have also been unable to save the sight in one of his eyes. Um, so a very, very, very nasty attack. And I've in no doubt at all that um, those that attacked Gary on that evening intended to kill him. Um, we heard Gary's sister say, you know, who wants people like that walking the streets? I mean, your appeal tonight is really to the community to come forward and to talk to you. It is. Um, where the attack happened in Central Parade, uh, where the leisure centre is, it's a very, very busy area in New Addington. Um, a number of people would have been present at that attack and would know the people that attacked Gary as well. And I'm really urging them people to come forward this evening. Uh, now, Simon, you're looking for a camera as well. Tell me more about that. Yes, Gary's father, John, actually took uh, photographs of some of the youths that were verbally abusing before the main attack. Um, that camera was stolen during the, the last attack on Gary. So we want to know where that camera is now because it holds vital information for us. And can you give us a little bit of information about the camera, the, the type of model it is and the colour of it? Yes, so it's a on? silver uh, Fuji camera, uh, 12 megapixel. Um, I think it's up on screen. Yeah, people saw it. There it is, just a moment ago. Yeah. Um, we should also tell people there's a, lar a large reward here. There is. There's a substantial reward, £20,000. And that's for information leading to the arrest, charge and successful prosecution of the person or persons who attacked Gary. So I'm urging everyone to come forward and really support uh, Wendy and John and the rest of their family and help Gary. OK, Simon, thanks very much uh, for now. As you saw there, this is a really shocking case. There are doubtless people watching tonight who know who did it. Please do call us now. It's the right thing to do. The usual number, 0500 600 600. Or, if you prefer, you can speak anonymously to Crime Stoppers. Their number, 0800 treble 5 treble 1. OK, time now for some CCTV with Martin. And we start with that sickening attack on a frail pensioner in Bristol, which happened in February. Inside a cost-cutter store on Avonvale Road in the city on a Sunday morning. A man in a hat wearing a distinctive black top, turquoise hoodie and scarf walks in and has a look around. After a few minutes, he leaves without buying anything. A few moments later, a pensioner who has to use a trolley to help him walk comes into the shop and is followed by the man in the hat. While inside, the elderly man collects his pension for the month as well as buying a newspaper. As he pays, the man in the hat loiters outside the shop, seemingly waiting for the pensioner to leave, covering his face with his scarf and hoodie as he does. The older man then makes his way home, followed by the man in the hat, whom he unwittingly lets through the flat security gates. The younger man hangs around the building's entrance while the pensioner lets himself in and is again able to sneak in while the door is open. Once inside the building, the pair get into the lift. The man in the hat, whose scarf is now pulled across his face, demands money from the terrified old man. When the doors open, the attacker blocks the victim's path and then assaults him, throwing him around the inside of the lift before grabbing his wallet and fleeing down the stairs. It was a despicable attack on a frail old man. Name this coward tonight. It's approaching 6 p.m. on a Friday evening last October inside a mobile phone shop in Croydon in South London. Four masked men force their way into the shop and start attacking the terrified staff. They herd frightened customers into a corner of the store before forcing one of the shop assistants to open the stockroom. Two of the gang then bundle the assistant into the cupboard where he's ordered to open the storage cabinets. The thieving pair then help themselves to bags and boxes full of iPhones worth more than £26,000, while their two mates stand guard at the front door. All four then flee. In total, they took 46 phones. Now we need you to use yours and call us tonight. 
A man waits outside a complimentary therapy centre in Northwood in Middlesex just after 5.30 on a Sunday evening last September. The therapist arrives and the man explains to her that he's early for his 6pm appointment. She opens the door and he follows her in. As soon as they're inside, he pulls out a knife and holds it to the woman's throat, demanding money. The attacker, who towers over his terrified victim, threatens to kill her as he wields the knife in her face. She explains there's no money and the knife man eventually leaves empty-handed. A terrifying ordeal. Name the man responsible. Lots more CCTV still to come and you can see it all again on the Crime Watch website. Call 0500 600 600 if you can help or text 63399. Type crime, leave a space and then your message. Matthew. Right, let's update you now on some of our previous cases, starting with a really excellent result. Earlier this year, we showed you this CCTV of a man who indecently touched two young girls while they were inside a shop in Swansea last July. Well, thanks to viewers, the man in the footage was identified as 52-year-old Stephen Frank Hansen from Cockett Road in Swansea. And last week, he was found guilty of two counts of sexual touching of a girl under 13. He'll be sentenced next month. Many thanks for your crucial calls. Next, news about two appeals which date back quite some time. The first was the rape of a 14-year-old schoolgirl in Hauling in Kent in 1986, which was subsequently linked to another rape in the same area in 1991. Well, a reinvestigation by Kent Police using new forensic techniques has identified the rapist as 50-year-old Ian John Phipps from Westmoreland in Kent. Earlier this month, he pleaded guilty to both attacks and has been sentenced to 15 years in prison. The victim from the first attack, Victoria Bacon, has waived her right to anonymity to describe what it was like to get justice after 27 years. I feel elated, I feel ecstatic, emotional. Um, I don't feel so angry, so bitter anymore. Um, I've been so angry and I've been so bitter for so long. Um, it's destroyed my family for many years, you know. Uh, but now, dear I think to myself, what a pathetic little man he is. But, uh, yeah, I just feel great, really great. Now, last year, we showed you this CCTV of a gang breaking into a designer clothes shop in Litchfield in Staffordshire. Well, thanks to your calls, the man in the hoodie was identified as 25-year-old Thomas Wheeler from Pleck in Walsall. At the end of last month, he was sentenced to 12 months after admitting the offence. Finally, you may remember the murder of 16-year-old Elaine Doyle, which we featured as a cold case two years ago. Elaine was killed as she walked home from a night out with friends in the small Scottish town of Greenock in June 1986. Well, last month, the 48-year-old man from the town was charged with Elaine's murder. We will, of course, let you know how that case progresses. Right, still to come tonight, Matthew reveals how ingenious detective work helped catch the man who thought he got away with killing his ex-wife, Vitalia Baliatavician. I could see that the person matched Vitalia's description. She was being forcibly dragged off the street, clearly against her will. I had a very bad feeling that something really significantly bad had happened to Vitalia. But right now, Martin has some more wanted faces. Yes, starting with Mark Gormley. Detectives want to speak to the 34-year-old in connection with a series of sexual assaults against children. Gormley has links to Bristol, Suffolk and Kent, though he may have travelled to mainland Europe. This photo was taken in 2008, so he may look different now. Next is Ahmed Kassim. He is wanted for recall to prison after breaching the terms of his licence. Kassim, who is 22, was serving a sentence for robbery, and police think that he's dramatically changed his appearance since this main image was taken. This CCTV from a London bus shows him as he looks now. Kasim has links across London, particularly Islington and Westminster. He's considered dangerous, so if you see him, don't approach. Just call 999. Number seven tonight is Peter Wiltshire. He was due to stand trial in connection with the rape and indecent assault, but failed to turn up at court. Wiltshire, who is 71 and uses a walking stick, has links to Bath and Cornwall, although police think he may have travelled abroad, most likely to France. And finally for tonight is Andrew O'Donnell. 
but he also uses the surnames Morrison and Lawson. Police are looking for the 33-year-old in connection with an alleged large-scale conspiracy to supply cannabis. O'Donnell has links to Gloucestershire, Worcestershire, Dorset and Spain. Call and text on the usual numbers if you recognise any of tonight's faces. And, of course, they're all online. Now, time to get the very latest, what's coming in on the phones. It's pretty busy at the moment. Clive Driscoll is in charge of the Stephen Lawrence investigation. Clive, if I can interrupt you for just a second, I know you've had some very promising calls. Take me through it. Yeah, no, most certainly. We've had, um, we've had several calls come in, one of which I, I'm, I'm very, very uh, pleased about. It's, uh, it actually does move us forward with potential suspects, which is um, very encouraging. Um, I think... Uh, also, there's a possible motive that has come in, which is, once again, it all adds to the information that we have and we can revisit everything to make sure that we're getting a clear picture. So, so, so far, it has been very encouraging. And all of that, I know, is new after 20 years. Tell me a little about the jacket and the witnesses around the bus stop that you were appealing for. Yeah, certainly the, the jacket, the man with the, the chevron or, or the V-shaped jacket, that is someone who would have been at the scene. That was someone who was at Wellhall roundabout at the time that Stephen was attacked. Now, if we can identify that male and if, in fact, we can then speak to that male, I believe that he would have information which would be significant. So th that is a piece of information or, or an appeal part that I would really like to progress. If we can identify him, it would be fantastic. Clive, I can see the phones are ringing again. I'll let you take that call. Thanks very much. Good luck. Okay. Martin. Time now for more CCTV, starting with an unbelievable attack on a doctor in Liverpool. Five hooded men approached the entrance to a GP surgery in Liverpool on a Wednesday evening in January. They surround a doctor as he's locking up for the night and begin to punch and kick him. One of them even slashes him across the face with a knife. They steal the victim's keys and his gold Rolex watch. One of them then unlocks his Audi TT, which is parked down the street. The rest of the gang seem to wander off, but seconds later, they're back, aggressively forcing the doctor into the busy road. The five attackers then squeeze into the doctor's Audi, and despite the victim standing in front of it, they drive off, hitting him. He's carried down the road, but luckily he wasn't seriously hurt. They may be hooded, but someone out there knows who they are. Tell us tonight. Inside the Shanachie pub in Wealdstone in Harrow during the early hours of a Saturday morning in February. The pub is full of people attending a birthday party. But check out the guy wearing the cap standing by the fruit machine. He may look in a celebratory mood at this point, but soon after he started arguing with other partygoers. An hour later we see him again and he's not so happy. Cameras outside the pub capture him walking off. But he's back a few minutes later. He immediately heads for a group standing outside the pub, which includes the people he had previously been arguing with. A scuffle breaks out and spills onto the road, where the man in the baseball cap suddenly pulls out a hammer, which police think he collected when he walked off. He then smashes it down on a man's head. The impact, which immediately knocked the victim unconscious, fractured his skull. The attacker then walks off. The blow from the hammer could have been fatal. We need you to name this violent thug tonight. A high-class jeweler's shop in Rochester in Kent on a Saturday afternoon last month. A man in a navy hoodie walks into the shop and asks to see a lady's Omega watch worth £6,000. It's expensive, so he takes his time, examining it for a good few minutes, checking its condition, asking about the warranty and whether it comes with the original box. He even borrows the jeweler's eyeglass to take a better look. Finally, he seems ready to make a decision, to leg it out of the shop with the watch. Time's up for this thief. Who is he? All tonight's CCTV is online, and if you recognise anyone, please call and text the numbers on screen. Now to the murder of young mum, Vitalia Balia Tavician. The 28-year-old Lithuanian moved to Peterborough three years ago to start a new life with her son. Matthew takes up the story of how this unprecedented case relied on the damning secrets contained within a little sat-nav box, just like this one.
And what we learned about that man is that he has no remorse and he is a dangerous, cold-hearted, manipulative killer. Twenty-eight-year-old Vitalia Balutovicien moved from her native Lithuania to Peterborough in 2010. Working all the hours she could to provide for her nine-year-old son, she was described as a caring mum who got on with everyone she met. So when she disappeared the following year, it was completely out of character, and police immediately feared the worst. One of the most striking elements of this investigation is uh, an early interview with Vitalia's son. And he said, without any prompt, that he thought that the reason his mum was missing was because his dad had killed her. I've heard him say it, that he's going to kill my mum and leave me in a children's home. Ex-husband Romantus Balietovicius subjected Vitalia to a life of violence and fear. Despite the fact they'd divorced, he followed her to Peterborough. He simply couldn't let go. In February 2011, Romantus was arrested and bailed after assaulting Vitalia. But before more could be done, he jumped bail and fled to Lithuania. Meanwhile, Vitalia tried to make a fresh start. Six months later, she left her house for work as normal. But she never arrived. A day after she was reported missing, police phoned Romantas to see if he knew of Vitalia's whereabouts. We were getting a foreign ringtone uh, from that telephone call. But when we did manage to speak to him, he was adamant that he hadn't been to the UK since February. But as they investigated further, they discovered he had travelled to the country the day before she vanished. We were able to show that his mobile phone had received a welcome to the UK text message, um, and it was indicative of him being in the area of Dover. So they checked the documents of all those travelling on ferries to Dover at that time. Romantis didn't appear on the passenger manifest, but uh, Rimas van Clovis did. And when we examined further that individual, what we found was somebody who looked very much like Romantis. When we explored vehicle details, what we found was a Lithuanian registered green Mercedes Vito van with a very distinctive number plate, ANU666. That vehicle was associated to Rimas van Clovis. Also, CCTV on Vitalia's route to work revealed something alarming. I could see that the person matched Vitalia's description. She was being forcibly dragged off the street, clearly against her will. I could see that the man that grabbed the person I thought was Vitalia uh, had striking similarities in physique to uh, that of Romantis. Uh, I had a very bad feeling that something really significantly bad had happened to Vitalia. Officers later found more CCTV showing Van Clovas's van driving away from Thistlemore Road 58 minutes after Vitalia vanished. He'd lied about being in the UK. His mobile phone was here. He'd changed his name and he'd come into the UK in a vehicle that we knew nothing about. And on that basis, I formed the opinion that actually in the absence of Vitalia's body, he was responsible for her murder. Then Clovas was arrested in Lithuania, and a month later, he was extradited to the UK. His van was seized, but no forensic evidence was found. But among Ven Clovas's belongings was an item that would become the key to unlocking the whole investigation. Officers found one of these, an ordinary sat-nav, and the closer they looked at it, the more clues it revealed. Then Clovas had typed in locations around Peterborough on the sat-nav, marking them as good and maybe in Lithuanian. That got me quite excited about the fact that maybe it had been used uh, in, in some sort of uh, pre-planned operation uh, before Vitalia went missing, and perhaps they were even sites that she, her body might be de deposited at. While they waited for further analysis from the sat-nav, 
Police searched the sites around Peterborough that Van Clovas had pinpointed, hoping it would lead them to Vitalia's body. But she was nowhere to be found. By now, Van Clovas was back in the UK, charged with kidnap and murder. As his trial loomed, detectives got the key evidence they needed. The full data from the sat-nav was back. It was a revelation. Um, actually, what we found was that this tiny little device had captured months of history uh, of Rimus using the device and indeed showed the entire route uh, from Lithuania, from his home address, all the way into the United Kingdom to Peterborough. Critically, the sat-nav data proved Van Clovas was in the area at the time Vitalia was abducted. At around 20 past five, I know that Vitalia was taken from the street. 58 minutes passes before the same van is seen leaving Thistlemore Road shortly after the sat-nav data takes us uh, on a route around Peterborough and that started to allow us to really focus in on likely places where he would have been interested in, in leaving Vitalia's body. The sat-nav also showed Van Clovas's return journey back to Lithuania and as searches for Vitalia's body in the UK drew a blank, police began to fear she could be further afield. It then became a potential reality that actually, against all the odds, he'd actually taken her out of the UK. That could be anywhere in France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Poland, or even as far as Lithuania. The coordinates from the sat-nav were sent to police across Europe. If a body was discovered along that route, it could be Vitalia. Even without Vitalia's body, I was confident that we had a good case against Van Clovis. But from a personal perspective, a conviction at that stage was, was only half the battle. Actually, what was more important was to be able to locate Vitalia and provide the comfort and the ability for a family to grieve, knowing what happened to their daughter. Then, just weeks before the trial was due to start, the crucial breakthrough came. Vitalia's body was found 900 miles from where she'd been abducted. I'll never forget the moment when I read the email to say that uh, a female had been found um, at exactly the location uh, of one of the stops that the sat-nav had recorded um, in what is a, a managed forest in a town called Latolsuchi uh, on the western side of Poland. Vitalia had been violently strangled. She had been murdered in the back of that van, uh, just a few hundred yards away from where she lived. Oh, you look then at the sheer cold-heartedness of a man who is prepared to drive her hundreds of miles across five or six countries and leave her buried in the middle of a forest in Poland just goes to show the, the depravity of a man who thought he'd got away with the perfect murder. Rimas van Clovas was handed a life sentence for the kidnap and murder of Vitalia, with a minimum term of 20 years. He thought he'd done enough to ensure that she would never be found, but he had no idea that his own sat-nav was leaving behind an electronic footprint that would prove beyond doubt that he had killed her. Van Clovis killed Vitalia. In doing that, left their son effectively an orphan. Um, and he is a dangerous, cold-hearted, manipulative killer. So, Matthew, the, the mobile phone records were important, the CCTV footage was very important, but the real gold mine was the set-nav stuff. Yes, Van Clovas knew he'd be the main suspect, but he was convinced he could murder and leave no trail. He was incredibly arrogant. He'd even done a complete dummy run, slipped in and out of the country in the weeks leading up to the actual abduction. But that arrogance evaporated the moment detectives told him they had the sat-nav. He knew the sat-nav 
held all the secrets. Uh, so the SatNav had all this raw data, but at this point they, they still didn't know where Vitalia was. Yeah, it was still a mammoth task, but with this type of SatNav, so long as it was turned on, it recorded every detail of every journey, right. not just the locations he typed in, everything. I mean, it was difficult. It took two sets of experts months to retrieve all the data, but when they did, it gave them the roads he'd used, where he'd stopped, and, crucially, how long he'd stopped for. So, in one place, Van Clovis had driven down a dirt track between two fields and waited there for nine minutes. It looked like a, a perfect place to bury a body. So, when detectives searched that area, they even had one of the team carry another on his shoulder to see how far you could get with a body in nine minutes. And that's what they concentrated on. And that's how they approached it. One location after another, then one country after another, until they found her in Poland. Very laborious. Um, he was uh, then found guilty. After that, it was a life sentence. Yes, life. And the judge described the murder as coldly planned and ruthlessly executed. And he said he had no doubt that Van Clovis had held her throat and kept her between life and death to make sure she knew what was about to happen. It's worth just saying that Van Clovis is planning an appeal on the basis that prosecutors cannot be certain in which country Vitalia was actually killed in. I mean, we saw in the film, the police are convinced she was killed in those 58 minutes in that van, on that street in Peterborough. So it's an appeal we'll keep an eye on. That's for sure, Matthew. Thanks very much. Uh, now it's time for a last quick update on what's come in on the phones. Here's Martin. Well, we start with that vicious attack on Gary Hayward in New Addington in Croydon. We've got some really promising calls coming through on this. Lots of potential names for people involved in that vile mob, including one name which has cropped up several times. Please keep those calls coming in. Wanted face number two, Martina McGrath. Lots of calls on this, several of which have put her in the same location over the last six months, including two calls which have come in saying they've seen her very recently. And Yasser Hussein, wanted face number four. A number of calls about him tonight, all very promising information, including a possible location. Right, that's everything for now. Remember, all of tonight's reconstructions, the CCTV and the Wanted Faces, all on the website. It's bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch. You can also stay up to date with how cases progress via Twitter. Follow at BBC Crime Watch. The phone lines, well, they'll stay open until midnight tomorrow. We're going to be back again tonight, of course, 10.35pm after the news, with the very latest on what's been coming in on the phones. The viewers in Northern Ireland are going to have to wait until 11.35 tonight. From everyone here, thanks for your calls. Do still keep calling. Bye-bye.